and welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. Each week, our in-house experts sit down with special guests to discuss depictions of World War II on film. Sit back and get ready for a lively debate that will reveal the good and bad of how Hollywood shows the 20th century's most dramatic event. My name is Seth Paradin, Historian and Digital Content Manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and today our special guests are Mike Scott, movie critic for NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. How you doing? Josh Schick, curator here at the National World War II Museum. Hello, Seth. And lastly, Larry DeCures, curator and Army veteran here at the National World War II Museum. Hey, Seth. Today we will be discussing the 1970 film Kelly's Heroes. Set in the late summer of 1944, Kelly's Heroes focuses on the exploits of an infantry platoon seemingly disillusioned with the war in Europe, who by chance stumble across a rumor about stolen Nazi gold residing in a bank 30 miles behind enemy lines. Bent on doing a little something for themselves in this whole cockamamie war, the platoon, along with a misfit Sherman tank unit headed by the single greatest character ever to be portrayed on film, Oddball, go on a one-way heist to steal the stolen Nazi gold. Kelly's Hero stars Clint Eastwood as Kelly, Telly Savalas as Big Joe, Don Rickles as Crap Game, Donald Sutherland as Oddball, and Archie Bunker, I mean Carol O'Connor, as General Colt. Kelly's Hero is directed by Brian G. Hutton and written by Troy Martin. The film was both a critical and financial success. So, uh, Mike, I'll start with you. I'll, I'll, I'll go first and say it's, it's also an artistic <laughs> success. This is, this is uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, as I was watching the movie, uh, re-watching it for this episode, it's got so much going for it, that cast. And you, you didn't even list everybody in mm. there. It's got everybody down to Uncle Leo from Seinfeld is in this <laughs> one. Sure does. But, it, but you know, it's, it's more than anything else, it's just fun. For, for sheer watchability, this movie ranks up there, for me, uh, among movies like The Great Escape, Bridge on the River Kwai, those, those inherently watchable World War II films. This one really is one of the greats as far as I'm concerned. Oh, absolutely. Josh, what about you? I like it. It's just, like you said, it... If it's on, no matter what part of the movie it's in, I'm going to stop and I'm going to watch it. It's just that entertaining. And, and then once you watch it, we were, Mike and I were talking about this a minute ago, uh, you watch it with a critical eye and you realize how much more depth and how much more even interesting it is other than how great of a movie and just solidly entertaining it is. So it was a great movie. What about you, Larry? I think it's the best war movie ever made. <laughs> Hands down. Yeah. Uh, it's just... <laughs> You're right, it's mother. just it's just one of those yeah. movies that they could never ever remake ever again. Just you know, the, the the cast is just a home run. I mean, it's a grand slam. You can't you can't duplicate that magic. You're really loving that. all these positive vibes, man. <laughs> yeah. These positive waves. <laughs> it really is a like. It's a meeting of like perfect. You you couldn't do it again. It's the people in it, the time period, their close association with the World War II generation, the like. Well, not Interesting just that. new edginess of the '60s, '70s, but a lot of the comedy too. A lot of the a lot of the, the one-liners in there. You know, people would be offended by some of that stuff today, and it's 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 hysterical. Mm-hmm. It really is. It's absolutely hysterical. But that's not exactly why we're here to talk about Kelly's Heroes. In your guys' opinion, I'm gonna go back around the other horn. I'll start with you, Larry. How accurate do you think Kelly's Heroes is? I think it does a good job. I mean, although it's, I think it's over exaggerated of course but i would say by late summer of 1944 if you're a rifleman on the front you're probably having those same same attitudes you know uh <laughs> like a lot of these you hear a lot of a uh, gi accounts where they're like uh, well i never saw you know a, a field grade officer come to the front you know it was only junior officers lieutenants and captains you know it, it just seems like uh if you were on the front lines, you were you were forgotten up there, you know, doing a crummy job. So I think the the attitude it captures is probably probably spot on for a for a line infantry unit for a bunch of draftees. They don't want no part of this, and they're just trying to get out of there with their skins intact. But you, Josh, I thought I agree with Seth I, or Seth Larry. Uh, there's two things, and I think one of them they kind of incidentally got remote, extremely accurate. The overall plot of the movie, like the whole heist thing, a little far-fetched for World War II as far as what they do and how they go through and how they find out about it and do that. But like what they get right in this movie, perhaps even without even knowing it, is that rifleman on the front line kind of 
watching it. This is how guys interacted with each other. This is just sort of a lot of the thoughts and feelings, the ways they reflected it. So I thought they nailed that overall plot. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll springboard off of that and, and talk about it. the, you know, a lot of World War II movies for me that they were made before this, the dialogue doesn't come off as, as necessarily honest or authentic. And that's because those, you know, the, the Hayes Code really set out a, a rigid set of rules of what you can and cannot say and show. Uh, it's it specifically, it specifies you can't say the words hell and damn. You can't take the, you can't say God or Lord outside of a religious context and anything, and you can't say anything unreverential using those words. And the the code went away. It, was, it's, it started to kind of erode in the 60s. By 68, it was, it went away and they introduced the motion picture, you know, the the, the rating system that we know today. And so this movie you hear them talk, and, and it felt to me a little bit more realistic in their interaction than they would when Telly Savala says, you know, get out of my way, you son of a bitch, or, or Rickles is saying, uh, you know... Uh, uh, Take the gas pipe, Sergeant, you prick. <laughs> That's the exact line. That's a great line. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you prick. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but there's an example of that language that totally wouldn't have flown before oh, yeah. uh, in, in the, in the, during the Hayes Code. And so I, I think that added another level because that relationship between the guys, the relationship between this band of brothers, it, it felt real. You felt that. And that, that, that's a big part of why this movie is so much fun. And, and you know, too, you, you mentioned the relationship between the guys. There's a love-hate in there. Oh, definitely. You know, Cowboy and um, what's his buddy's name? I'm drawing Willard. Away. Willard. They're pals. Mm-hmm. They're buddies. You know, they're they're Batman and Robin where one is, the other one's right behind. But then you got guys like Crap Game. Who, yeah, he's an outsider, but I mean, he doesn't mix well with a lot of guys in there, you know. And then there's even even Big Joe, you know, he's kind of a he's kind of a jerk at, at times. So there is that love hate. You got guys who love one another, and, and you know, are gonna they're buddies, they're pals. And you got other guys. Who, yeah, yeah, you're here. <laughs> but but you know that's how <laughs> you know? that's how guy relationships Absolutely. are. You know, you, you they, they're giving each other grief. Huh? There, there's one scene when they're coming off the minefield, and Rickles is telling uh, Big Joe, "Get the hell out of my way!" And he's he's you know belly aching about carrying his 30 caliber uh, uh, gun, and and Joe doesn't say anything. He doesn't react. You know, he does. They 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 just kind of give as good as they get, yeah. and they know that they're not in a good situation, and they just sort of acknowledge it and take it. And that's how guys deal with one another. That's yeah. sort of nurture through teasing sort of thing. <laughs> I thought, heavy in Kelsey's burgers. <laughs> I thought uh I thought that one of the best like unit interaction like showing that they care for each other is when Big Joe gets back with the uh, the films that he has a chaplain hold for him. <laughs> uh it was a great part. <laughs> Subtle, love it. Um comes in and he basically interrupts Kelly laying it out to the rest of the platoon and Joe kind of comes to their defense is like, "Listen, you know, I'm it's my job to get these guys home and actually, you know, for, from a character development standpoint, Joe's defending those guys because he cares about them. Mm-hmm. You know, he may call them turds a few minutes later, but at the same time, it, I thought his stepping in and there trying to block Kelly off from sending them on some extremely risky venture was very telling and really kind of, for me, kind of pulled that unit together in a way that made sense. It wasn't just a bunch of guys taking shots at each other every 10 minutes. Yeah, and, and along those lines, the way that the running joke throughout the movie where Big Joe is calling Private Barbara Barbara. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Big Joe, don't call me Barbara. It's Barbara. <laughs> But that's, uh, you know, no matter how motivated a, a GI or a soldier is, they can find a situation where, where they can bitch about anything, right? So when uh, Crap Game's asking Kelly, he's like, how, how did we get talked into this mess? It took you about five seconds to get talked into this mess. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you talk about uh, Big Joe's uh, overall affection for his guys. When those guys get killed in the, in the minefield... Mm-hmm when they get zapped there by the German uh, platoon coming in on, in that minefield, you know, you see it on all those guys' faces, you know, they're like, oh, man. You know, you can see the uh, the sorrow, if you will, or, you know, the regret on their faces in that scene. Um, as far as accuracy is concerned, Josh, and you kind of touched on this a bit, but uh, in your guys' opinion, I already know my answer, but could do you think a unit could have executed a stunt such as the one we see in this movie? In reality, in World War Two, I think it's possible. Sure, it, thirty-five miles behind enemy lines. I think it's possible. When what part of the war? Well, I mean, you, you know, know, at this part of the war, you know, mid to late forty-four. I guess this would be late forty-four. You know, I late think summer. someone running light, maybe on foot, something like that, could pull something like that. But I mean, we're talking like bum rushing through rail yards and sneaking through occupied towns under barrages. I, I'm, there are certain aspects of it that, to me, could operationally maybe make sense, but that's a lot of movement behind lines into, you know, 
deeply yeah. enemy occupied territory. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think in a unit. I mean, it was a pretty good sized group of guys. Oh, we yeah. could fight. We got an army. You know, it's a pretty good sized group of guys who's moving thirty five miles by an enemy. Even line. the that's grave diggers way. are in on that thing. Well, that's during the collapse <laughs> of France too. The Germans are pulling across the Seine by that time. Yeah, but st- that's a long ways to go, man. Thirty five miles with a with an armored column, essentially. Well, that's the other thing too. We're not driving hybrids. You know, you have to bring a lot of gas with you if you're hauling two half tracks, two jeeps. You know, there's a lot of it. Going to war isn't just putting on your backpack and jumping in your truck and going. You know, there's for every one guy in the European theater, you got seven trying to keep him supplied. Thirty five miles behind enemy lines on a whim in three days is pretty extreme. I, I think I think a raid like that, and for that's all intents and purposes, that's what this is, could have been done and may have been done on a short, you know, five ten mile jaunt maybe Ask, yeah, but even but if the it's, a- even SAS if, was doing this sort of thing in North Africa you know I mean it's it's possible what about a bomb no oh, yeah that's true ask a bomb yeah but even if it's far-fetched I think that's one of the reasons the movie works so well Absolutely. it's it's a it's a it's a fantasy it's an action fantasy and that's what any good heist movie is and that's what this is to me first and foremost is a, a heist movie in a, in a, a well-executed heist movie if, if it was easy to buy if it was easy to buy the, the story it, it's not creative enough and it's not going to be fun enough it's got to be extraordinarily complex it's got to be it's got to be nuts uh and and that's what this was when it that's what this one is and that's why it works i think see i was having i was trying to call it a heist movie and i didn't whether no no whether or not to because you know normally you have a heist movie and it kind of plots and you're usually like oh that's how they pull it off this one they seem to be stumbling through it you know right. like they know where it is uh, let's meet here. We'll go do this. You know, it's kind of it's got that like well, you know, the, fluid the, element. The of screenwriter it. Troy Kennedy Martin, he wrote the the year before he wrote the Italian Job, which I think we uh, can agree is a straight up heist movie. And I'm I'm willing to bet that he decided that was fun. Let me do another heist movie, but I just need a good setting, and somehow got the idea of you know France during the war. Yeah, but they 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 depicted the outfit as the right type of outfit. They're a reconnaissance platoon. They operate beyond the lines anyway. Yeah, you know so. I mean, to me, it's it's, it's plausible. Plausible, yeah. yeah. It's, it's plausible. Certainly plausible. Well, the 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 object that they're after here is Nazi gold, and uh, Nazi gold is referenced often in the media. Actually, it's not Nazi gold on TV right now. It's Japanese gold, according to the History Channel or the you know, so-called History Channel uh, in the Philippines. But how how common was it, and would it have been uh, moved and stored as shown in the film? I mean, we all know that you know the the decaying Reich. You know, we were talking uh, about stolen Nazi gold and stolen Jewish gold. What, do you, what, is, what is your opinion on that? I think the uh, whole gold thing is always, always one of those, you know, people mix Nazis and zombies and Nazis and gold. They love doing that. And um, <laughs> you know, as the Reich falls down, Berlin still is holding all of the gold reserves. And the Reichsbank, it's not just gold. In real life, what people were going after in robberies that involved Nazi gold. It was more than just bars of gold. It was actually gold coins, uh, almost an equal amount in currency from all sorts of countries, millions and millions in U.S. dollars, British pounds, French francs, Deutschmarks. And all of that was centralized in Berlin until the first thousand bomber raid put about 20 bombs into the Reichsbank. And they say, we got to move all this stuff. So they moved it all south, and about 90% of the total gold reserves of the German um, economy were in the mines in Metz when they were captured by Patton's Third Army. But a little chunk got split off, and that stuff got hidden in little piles in the Alps. So that's kind of the origin story of all this, like, Nazi gold, where is it? So there wouldn't have been reserves hanging out in France, you know, for distribution. It would have all been centralized in Berlin or brought down to the Alps because that was going to be the national readout. Mm-hmm. So still, though, there's that that kernel of truth, that nugget of truth, if I if I if I may, hardy har har, that, that helps make it just <laughs> easier to buy the the fantastic story. Definitely, yeah. There there's something to work for there, and and the you know, there's a Nazi this book Nazi Gold comes out a long time after this movie is made, and the the movie actually hits some of the elements mm-hmm. of the actual gold heist and Deutsches Bank fall down and everything. So there's a lot of plausibilities in it. So it's it's not so far fetched. People would seek out gold, not thirty miles behind the line in France. End of lecture. So you're Clay. saying so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's talk about how uh, 
how accurate the depictions are of, and we again, Larry, you you touched on this a bit. How accurate the depictions are of the servicemen going AWOL, you know, guys just bolting, and their lack of respect for authority, which which I think that was part of part of my question that was combined in the two, our talking points rather. What do you think, Larry? How accurate do you think that portrayal is? I mean, it's probably like I said earlier, it's probably a pretty good depiction of a a line infantry unit full of draftees, you know, at that point in the war, you know. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I I think the reason why this movie works the way it does in 1970 is because all those guys in that movie, they're most of them are World War II veterans themselves, you know, and. This is a common experience with guys who are about 45 years of age, right, at that point in 1970. So this was – that's I think that's why it's so funny because everybody can look at it and like, oh, yeah, I knew that guy in the Army or I knew that guy in the Navy or, yeah, it was just like that, you know. Um, I think it's it does a better job of uh, capturing, I guess, the, the authentic, authenticity of the experience rather than – you know, some of the other movies we've covered in the past where it's, you know, a propaganda piece where it's for flag and mom and apple pie and all that kind of junk, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I think the, the portrayal of the GIs and the way they treat or mistreat <laughs> their leadership is extremely accurate. I mean, the guys who are in the front, of which I knew many as we probably all have over the years, you know, they were the ones that were taking the heat. They were the ones that were taking the nasty stuff and, and doing the killing and being shot at day to day to day to day. And uh, as you said earlier, you know, any not not always, but anybody above the rank of captain generally was not even anywhere near that, that part of the front. And uh, I can totally see that ir- irreverent behavior towards their leadership to be completely accurate. Well, and, and the filmmaker helps them by, I mean, the, the Carol O'Connor character is an absolute boob. He, he is a, a buffoon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yes, and is. so it just sort of plays into their criticisms of him. You, you watch and you're going, well, yeah, they're right. Yeah. You know, this guy's an idiot. And so. ca- Captain Maitland, you know, the, yeah. their, their CO, their company commander. He, he, with Remember, his yacht, gentlemen, with don't his loot <laughs> yeah. as he, he goes jogging after the, the yacht. Yeah, loot what? There's nothing here to loot. I, th- I think that it is... It's interesting because it, I call the unit cook down. You know, if that's like an INR platoon, it should be about 30, 40 guys in it, but there's not in this movie. You know, the only thing they're not talking about is guys that maybe they lost along the way. And so this point in the war, it's all the guys that are left just getting boiled down and, you know, they're all disgruntled together and dealing with all this stuff together. And so I think that's entirely plausible. I think their attitude is spot on for not every single guy on the front lines, but certainly a vast majority. Yeah, I, I I agree. Like I said, I mean, their lack of respect for authority, I think, is I mean, they respect Joe because he's their leader, and Joe's gotten them through everything so far, you know. And and Kelly too, to a point. I mean, it's, you know, they make the reference that Kelly was an officer at one time, and he wiped t- attacked, got orders to attack the wrong hill, and he wiped out half a company of GIs. And uh, I mean, they know who's in charge. They they follow him, not blindly by any means, but you know, because you hear the you hear the bitching back and forth all, all the time, but. But it is, I think it's very, very, very accurate in, in that term. Um, looting is prominent in this film. <laughs> how common was it in actuality? And let's just stick to Europe. Let's stick to the European theater. How common was it in European theater? <laughs> Wild bear crap was, in the woods? <laughs> yeah, I think it was the GI's pastime to mm-hmm. see what they could, you know, salvage, <laughs> acquire, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Nazi regalia in the United States. You know, it's a Tons. big collector's market. Tons. Where do you think oh, yeah. it came from? You, you see yeah. Gavin yeah. McLeod in, in the in the closing of the movie when they're riding off into the sunset on his tank, and he's wearing a an SS <laughs> uniform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you know, it just take anything. I, I heard it described as take anything that wasn't nailed down, and if it was, I got a hammer, popped the nails off, took that too. I mean, it's it's a miracle they didn't take more yachts. Yeah, I mean, that's you, you look at a cross section of our collection. I mean, Nazi flags, Lugers, German helmets, you name it. I mean, that's that's what to spoil the war. Yeah, that's what we well, it's also it's a big majority of our collection. I think it's a it's a memory thing, too. You're not gonna you're not gonna sit down there with your kid and or your grandchild and say, you know, 
Look at this uniform I wore when I waited in line for six hours at the army or did a bunch of this stuff. Now, check out this stuff I took from Germany when we conquered it. So, you know, it's sort of conquerors come in and, yeah, I've earned this. I'm going to take this. And But then it goes a little bit beyond what I would call looting when you take precious gold and everything <laughs> and all that stuff. But, I mean, you know, this is not the only movie that addresses that. Like, if you look at Catch-22, you know, there's a syndicate. And they're they're dabbling in everything from Egyptian cotton and fresh eggs to prostitution. You know, I mean, so this is, I think this this is probably much more common than than the history books. Uh, you know. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> absolutely. Um, there's even um, I don't know if you call it sanctioned, but uh, and Larry knows a little bit more about this than I do. Capture papers. Yeah, You know, capture papers on items, rifles usually specifically. I've seen them for cameras and some things like that. And that is, for all intents and purposes, legal loot. You know, mm -hmm. you took it, you captured it, you took it from the German war effort. And then a lot of enlisted guys would be given this document that says, hey, this guy's allowed to bring this item of foreign property home. And there's an interesting stipulation on at least some of them that says it can't exceed the value of their training. Hmm. Or, you know, that value or of sentimental value as long as it doesn't exceed X amount. So you can't say I'm like really emotionally attached to this gold brick. But, you know, more of these like, you know, I found this camera. Or a Yeah. <laughs> I found this camera. Okay, well, that's cool. Here's your capture papers. Take it home. But, all, I mean, the, the amount of silver that must have been taken home by yeah. you guys. I mean, there's, there's plenty of documented cases of guys taking silver sets home. Oh, definitely. You know? Yeah. Capture paper really only seems to apply to just like some specific items. Yeah. Weather they didn't say, oh, America. one set of family, you know, silverware. No, mm -hmm. put it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look at crap game. You talk about looting. You know, it might be a little exaggerated as we, we talked about that, you know, he's sitting literally in a mountain of material. You know, I mean, Kelly goes in there and it's like he's going shopping at the local Walmart. Yeah, yeah. Stacking up, racking up Thompsons and 1919s and ammunition, not the wazoo. Oh, yeah. And he picks up Oddball and his people. And, I mean, crap game is literally he's on the phone making a deal. Remember those nylons I got you? Yeah, I never yeah. miss. He's making a deal yeah. for, for other items as he's getting rid of the items that he's already, you know, pilfered. Yeah, and pilfered he's, along he's the framed way. by a case of doers behind him and, <laughs> yeah. you know, red label going by in the background. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It yeah. is beautiful. And so there is, there is looting from the German war effort and there's looting from the American army, and that's two definite things right there. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I think that's in Citizen Soldiers, I believe, where they talk about how everything from the port battalions to the rail battalions, everything was looted i'm talking about the the u.s supplies you know like uh they they chalk a crate of this up to breakage you know and then by the time that it got to you know big joe and guys like that up at the front lines who are riflemen the only thing they were getting up there were k rations ammo and uh bad cigarettes. raleigh cigarettes yeah. yeah which were the worst cigarettes that you could get at the time well, Kelly's Heroes is somewhat unique as a war film as it focuses on entertainment over historical facts and authenticity. Uh, and this is, I think we could all agree that this is a, quote, fun, unquote, war movie. Does it, do you think it uh, cheapens the sacrifice or, or is it excusable to make a picture that just happens to entertain? Well, I think in 1970, I think it was a shared experience by, you know, guys of a certain age. And I don't think it cheapened it in the least. No, I, I agree. I don't think it does either. But I, I think, especially because of when it was made, right? it's very accurate for the audience. It's very accurate for the time. I I think it it doesn't cheapen it because when someone is killed, it is handled respectfully. It's mm -hmm. not like zany or kooky or just kind of brushed off to the side. It does happen. It sees it affects them, and then they're back to being, you know, them entertaining selves. They're entertaining selves. So I so totally is that agree. The, is that the line, you think, where, where it goes from being uh, entertainment to exploitation? Like if, you know, Medea is very Medea. Tyler Perry's very Medea D Day. Is that is is the line drawn <laughs> then, or, or Ernest goes to France? I mean, where there, there, there's yeah. there's a fine line there. That, Give me that, the M two, Vern Vern. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think in the context of it, you know, since they get the unit so well, you know, just the way those guys are, it's not overt. It's not making fun of World War Two. It's just these guys that are doing something, and it happens to be extremely entertaining, influenced by its decade. And then it's respectful towards what happens to those guys when they make these risks. Yeah. You know, I think when it's come charging in where it's just kind of Nazi zombies on D-Day, for instance, um, you know, then it's getting a little ridiculous. 
No, I don't. I don't. I, I agree with y'all. I, I don't think it cheapens anything because, as you said, you know, when someone is killed in action, they they show it with respect. And I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of killing going on in this movie. I mean, when Oddball and his boys roll up in that that rail yard, I mean, they are laying waste in there. And I mean, which of course we both we all know that 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 wouldn't that would not have happened in that in that regard. But it's always fun to kill Nazis in a movie. Oh, yeah. The ba- the battle after the minefield was also fairly. It was a, a really good action sequence, but it, it was, was it was pretty brutal as well. It was they they didn't they didn't hold back on that. No, they didn't. There's one scene and there's one shot in there in particular that always strikes me as being kind of like ooh. I know where like, you going. That's kind of stout, you know. When Kelly and the guys come behind him, and they just he he takes that Thompson and he just rakes those mm-hmm. guys right in the gut and right but right in the back, and I mean he's as close as I am to you right now, which is about three feet away. Yeah. And that that's pretty tight, you know. And, I mean, he, they, the, the camera shows both of them. It shows the Germans and him. And, I mean, that's not uncommon for Clint Eastwood either, you know, where Eagles tear. But, yep, body count. Yeah. <laughs> but I, th- I, th- I don't think it cheapens anything. I mean, it's this is, a, this is, in my opinion, this is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. And I've seen it a hundred times. But it, it's I think it's great. And I don't think... Um, that it cheapens anything, and I think it's perfectly excusable for the comedy to be there because there was comedy in war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not all obviously funny, but it's not all blood and gore and death either. I think making the best of their situation, which is an arguably terrible one, making the best of it involves seeking out food, seeking out comfort, seeking out companionship, taking shots at each other. That's why I think that's why the humor is well placed in it. Is this why we pay our taxes to be bombed by our own damn air force? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's some great social commentary on it. Yes, there. there is. Yes, there is. Go get yourself a bucket of grits. Well, no, you know, I was thinking of uh, Donald Sutherland's character in those tankers. I mean, that's probably a very true assessment of a, a World War II, uh, you know, Sherman crewman who had to face a 60 ton Tiger tank and their 32 ton Sherman. <laughs> Yeah, you know, all I can do to uh, slow them down is let them shoot holes in me. You yeah, know, that's pretty much. It was a very accurate yeah. reaction, mm-hmm. and um, and even you know the words "hippie commune" come up whenever you meet <laughs> them, <laughs> and yeah, it's got that flavor. But you've also got a crew of tanks that aren't too excited about going against something that will just roast them fo- full of holes. And then uh, it's not beyond tank crews to modify their tanks for either their own comfort or maybe their own survivability, up armor kits, things like that. Now, where Oddball is machining paint-filled ammunition, I'm not sure where that falls in the supply train, but, you know, I think it's a fairly good picture of a, a little armored unit. Paint's pretty pictures, man. Paint's pretty pictures, <laughs> Scares man. the hell out of people. It's going uh, this, to be a beautiful battle. This film is very much a reflection of the era in, what was ma- in, in which it was made. It was released in 1970, so it was produced in 69. Mm-hmm. I, I assume, late 69. Late 69. How does that come through, and how does it impact the story, do you think? I think there are, well, uh, the, the obvious way, I think, is Oddball. Mm-hmm. They just think the anachronistic character of Oddball, who is, you could, you could try to argue he's a beatnik. Dude's a hippie. Through oh, yeah. and through, mm-hmm. through, through, no question about the it. The hair, man. The hair. <laughs> Also, the music, and this is, if there's one complaint that I have about the film, if, if I can throw out some, some negative waves on you guys, the music, it, it always bothers me when you see a music that's in a, in, a, uh, in a period piece that's clearly not of that piece. They do it in, uh, in, in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids. In, the, in a beautiful sequence and a beautiful song, raindrops keep falling on my head, but every time I watch that, that, that scene from that movie... It kind of takes me out of it because it just doesn't feel authentic to the period. And the the music here, uh, what is it, Burning Bridges by the uh, Mike Curb congregation. And then there's also a Hank Williams Jr. song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, b- both of those songs, incidentally, were written by uh, the guy who scored it, whose his name is Lalo Schifrin, who is most famous for writing the Mission Impossible theme. So he's a product of the, of the, of the 60s. And then it, he co-wrote it with Mike Curb, who wrote uh, Nixon's, uh, Richard Nixon's campaign song, Nixon Now More Than Ever. So both of them <laughs> definitely, they're definitely products of their time. And, and the music, I think, shows it as well. But even more than that, now I think this, this actually plays in its favor, is the, there's a wicked level of subversion going on. This is a subversive movie because they're talking about their, their, uh, their, their commanding officers and their you know, trash-talking authority. But there's even a moment in uh, when, when – it's the great moment when Clint Eastwood, Telly Savalas, and Donald Sutherland are walking down the street and they're playing that spaghetti western music, oh, yeah. sort of an, a, a nod to, uh, to, yeah. to Clint Eastwood's spaghetti western days. 
and they're trying to convince uh, an SS guy, an SS officer, to sort of help them out, to join their little uh, their little band of of, of felons. And uh, and, and Savalas gives this little speech where he says, "We don't even know why we're here," which seems to me to be very much a Vietnam era thing more than a World War II thing. People knew why we were in World War II. I mean, it was, you know, to, to stop the Nazis, to stop Hitler, to stop the atrocities. Uh, that, they, that just felt to me like a, a definitely a, they were speaking to their 1970s audience. I, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, you hear some guys, like you say, Larry, draftees, you know, complaining, oh, I don't even know why the hell I'm here. You know, I was in college or I was doing this and that. And the other, but it's rare. Mm-hmm. It's more rare. But in Nam. You hear a lot of that, you know. Because you, nobody knew why they were there. Yeah, right. They didn't know why they yeah. were there. But you're right. That scene as they're walking down the street, that is that is an ode to the man with no name. Yeah, no question. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I Going back to your comment about the music, it, for me, the music is, it's absurdly out of character for a World War II flick. But mm-hmm. for me, um, a couple times it plays, they're doing something absurd. And so it kind of works out for me. You know, they're playing bridges there at the beginning, and he's driving a Jeep through a town raked with mortar fire and full of hundreds of Germans who anyone at any point could drop their gun, go off, and basically hit them. And they're doing this absurd thing, and this absurd music starts playing that's totally off of what you're seeing, and it kind of worked for me. It works better for me when they play that the, the theme, the, the instrumental theme, where there's the whistling, which is, look, that's a cliche ever since Bridge yeah. on the River Choir, but <clears throat> the whistling and the, the snare drums, that sort of feels a little bit more... Uh, Martial. Little, yeah, it feels more, a little more true to the story, and it does kind of get my, my juices going, at least as much as the way Burning Bridges does. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I can't stand that song. <laughs> oh no, it's weird. Been singing song. it in my head all day today, yeah. Steph. I can't. I, I can't get it. out of my, my my head. Cannot stand that damn song. They're playing an instrumental version too. When when um when <clears throat> Kelly's being walked around their tanks, it's playing in the background too. That got stuck in my head. <laughs> well, uh, let's discuss the influence of this film on others, and noticeably the movie Three Kings, which. Uh, if I remember correctly, Marky Mark is in that Marky movie. Marky Mark, George Clooney, Ice Cube yeah. is also in that. Hey, when, when did that come out? Like ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah. So that was that was a reference to the the two thousand or the nineteen ninety two nineteen ninety one Persian Gulf War, uh, and it, it was shot by or directed by David O. Russell. And in it, you have three guys in Iraq who get a hold of a, a of a treasure map uh, and go off on this treasure hunt for Saddam's gold. So. It's it's pretty clear that this is a uh, more a rip off than an homage, I think, to uh, to Kelly's heroes. And normally, I, I don't have a lot of uh, a whole lot of patience for that kind of thing. But that's a good movie. Uh, the a good Three movie. Kings really does work well. It, it's artistically shot with that really high contrast that emphasizes the desert. And if if there's one thing I think it's got working against it is the, the group of guys is smaller. I think that's one of the things about Kelly's Heroes that works so well in its favor is you, like you said, we've got an army. You only have that three core, the, the the core group of three guys, which works against it a little bit. But that's it's it's a really enjoyable movie, rip off or not. Yeah, it it is a pretty good flick. What what do you guys think? I think it's. <clears throat> I mean, I I think they're and three kings are faced with a morality issue. Unlike they, are, I mean, Kelly's Heroes, you're not presented with that, like. It's okay. there, though. I mean, I, 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 that was something that I did consider as I'm watching yeah. it. I'm like, oh, hey, wow, is this okay? <laughs> you know, because we know that Nazi gold wasn't originally Nazi gold. We, I mean, it was, it was, it was stolen. It was pilfered. Right. It was, it, it's, 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 it's bloody money. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know. So I, I, I did struggle a little bit with that watching it, rewatching it for for this podcast. But I mean, I think that's the difference between the two films. You know, Kelly's Heroes and Three Kings. I mean, and Kelly's Heroes, they aren't. Faced with a choice, oh, we got to dump this gold to save these people. Mm, dang. You know, so. Which they wouldn't have done anyway. <laughs> I mean, who knows? But... They would not have done that anyway. <laughs> See, they, never by the way, $16 million, I, I, did the, I did the math on that. Adjusted for inflation, it would have been $227 million. Wow. And the 800000 that that Rickles figured they each walked away with would have been like twelve or $13 million. Jeez, so those geez. are some big numbers. That, that's why they're so excited. And I was like, 800000 That's it? <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take 800000 That can solve a lot of problems, I'll tell you. It was gold bars from Deutsche Bank were about 25 pounds, and they were worth about $30,000 wow. per bar. But the ones in the movies didn't seem to weigh 25 pounds. I think pounds. they're more movie-ish. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> There's only one scene where, they, where it's very obvious that they're faking the weight when they pick up one of the crates of gold to throw it in the back of the... Back of the uh, half track or deuce and a half, I don't remember which one it is. 
and I think it's Cowboy picks it up and he slams it down on the <laughs> on the deck of the truck to make it seem a lot heavier than it you're is. trying too hard, Cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> Pro wrestling move. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, Switzerland's only what is it? Only hundred miles, hundred miles away. Don't want anybody Don't want getting, anyone lost. getting lost. <laughs> Well, we're rolling through this one pretty fast yeah. because it's it is it is a good movie. It's an easy movie to talk about too. Well, um, what did you guys think about it? Did you, Mike? I'll start with you. Did you like this movie, and would you recommend it? Absolutely. And you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, I this was I've watched this movie at, at least a half a dozen times before. This is the first time I watched it with a critical eye. This is the first time I ever watched it for anything more than just entertainment. And what one of the things that really struck me is. From a technical standpoint, from a filmmaking standpoint, it's a really well-made movie. The, and the the, the 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 screenplay moves along nicely. That 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 mind sequence, as I mentioned earlier, is a very well choreographed action sequence, and it does a, a nice job of kind of a little vignette to get us from here to there to, to move the story along. And then when the, the siege of Claremont, when they go into to Claremont, Claremont to uh, Claremont, to, Claremont Booker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to 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 finally zero in on the gold. There are some really beautiful shots. The cinematography there is really well done, and then the suspense. You know, they 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 use very little sound. They're sneaking around, and they, and it goes on for a long time. That scene must go on, but in up until the point where uh, Rickles ends up in the in the, the latrine into the in the outhouse. You mm-hmm. know, uh, up, up till that point, from the moment they step into that town, it's uh it's it's an edge of your seat but quietly played sequence. It's really expertly done from a sus- suspense standpoint. And then again, the shots, the shots of the bell tower. I forget who it is at one point. It's looking through a door and you, it's just a crack in the door, but it's perfectly framing the bell tower. There's some really, some, some, there's some really good camera work going on there. Mm-hmm. Josh? I think it's a wonderful movie. Just entertaining to boot, you know. Uh, it, it's kind of the same thing. I, I'd never really watched with a critical eye. I was just excited to watch it because it's so entertaining. And then I kind of started like, all right, I need to start analyzing this thing because I'm supposed to talk in a room with microphones about it to other people. And it was, um, <laughs> I like it even more, <laughs> you know, like the. You know, I, the, I, I agree with you totally. I, I love this movie coming in, but watching it with a, with a critical eye, it's, it's, it's better than I thought yeah, it was. Just it really like, is. It's just, it's solid. Dialogue's great. The, um, the thing about the filming, of, and I'm not good at the art, Art, artsy stuff, but uh, like the depth of all the stuff they have. So, you know, there, there's that scene where uh, little Joe drives up in the Jeep. He's got the shirt tied around his head and he's telling them they're pulling back and that sets it all up. And uh, and there's a huge column of Shermans, you know, going up the road. There's all this other stuff. And I'm, I'm sure we can touch on where they filmed and why they filmed there in a little bit. But uh, it's just got a lot of depth, whereas a lot of movies kind of get stuck. Like when we talked about Fury, the battles are very tiny because they only had these three tanks and like 50 dudes to work it on. This thing is massive. There's extras out the wazoo, the big dramatic scenes of them coming into, coming into the town and everything. I just, I just liked it even more after I watched it with a critical eye. Well, you, you mentioned it. Let, let, let's go with that. You're talking about why, where they filmed it and why. Yeah, go find the stuff. Yugoslavia, yeah. you know. Right. Once uh, once the American Army finishes all that stuff, man, 34-ton Sherman weighs a lot, and it's going to be obsolete soon. Give it to the next guy that needs it or sell it to him. And so a lot of that equipment ends up in Yugoslavia and a lot of these Slavic countries. A lot of the stuff out in the Pacific ends up in New Zealand because the Navy's not going to drag it all back. So you've got these, like, bastions of, of World War II equipment hanging around, and, and you go there, and, and I'm sure they were totally willing with them to drive their tanks through buildings and blow up blow up buildings left and right to let them film it and makes an even more interesting experience. Yeah, there's definitely no real CGI in this movie at all. When you see those explosions, they are, you know, they they look pretty dang good. I that's one of the things I love about that train yard scene is like those are legit explosions. It's yeah. not this like Little fire. Yeah. yeah, you know, everything is a little mushroom cloud, a little puff of smoke, pyrotechnic stuff. It looks pretty legit. Like, and, my and foot might be missing if I get too close. And when they're blowing up those buildings, when they're blowing up the farmhouse in the very beginning, they are lighting that sucker up. I mean, that is, that's not a, I don't think that's a set. I could be wrong. That damn sure doesn't look like a set to me. I think it became a set and then they blew it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the bla- the blessing and the curse, I guess, of technology nowadays with, with uh, CGI. They can fake anything. But often it looks you can you can, you tell. can tell here when you use some practical effects. You, if you want to blow up that barn, blow up that barn. And men do they? They make like <laughs> that sucker up. They blow the hell out of it. Well, Larry, what about you? Did you like it? And would you recommend it? 
I hated it. <laughs> of course, I loved it. Um, I like the, the the extra effort they went to actually, uh, you know, replicate a German Tiger tank, mm-hmm. and they they did it with three tanks. You know, I don't think there's a movie, but I think the only movie that's done that since is uh, Saving Private Ryan, um, where they've actually taken and replicated that. That behemoth of a tank. That was know? a T thirty four that they mm-hmm. did for Private Ryan. It's the same thing for uh, for Kelly's, for Kelly's yeah, as well. Which is why it's yeah. spitting so much smoke out the back when they turn it on. Yeah, and I mean, well, you know, Fury they used the real Tiger, which is pretty damn impressive too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You miss your mother. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think this is one of my very favorite movies ever. Uh, not in the realm of like Battleground or Twelve O'clock High, which are two totally totally different movies and very serious movies this is one of those flicks that whenever it's on i watch it and and it's like one of those movies that too like uh, the searchers for completely different reasons that i have to watch it every few months just because it's usually good on a friday night after a long week of work you know with a three four classes of kentucky whiskey with me and it's it's it gets funnier by the by the minute and it gets funnier seemingly every single time i watch it so, yeah, I would absolutely recommend this movie. I don't think there's too many people who probably haven't seen it. Yeah, I'd no. agree with that. But, you know, it's not one that gets talked about a whole lot. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this, is when people are talking about World War II films, this one doesn't come up, but I don't know that I've met anybody who hasn't, like, if, if I mention to Seth, I know the reaction that, 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 that I'll get if I mention the movie Pearl Harbor. It's crap. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anybody who's going to give that kind of a reaction to Kelly's Heroes. I don't know anybody who's even ambivalent, like, oh, yeah, it's pretty good. Everybody loves this movie. Yeah. You know? yeah. it, it is like, it's, a, it's an overlooked classic, I think. I mean, you know, it has, you know, we always talk about authenticity in this, in this podcast. And it, it does have some elements that are, you know, that are not authentic. You mentioned the gear. I mean, the Shermans are real, obviously. The uniforms, by and large, look pretty good. And the Thompsons are Thompsons. But the, the BARs, you know, those are the Belgian BARs. They're not the, the American-type BARs. And, they're, and the haircuts are very 1970 haircuts. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, you seemingly... For a person like – for people like us who look at that kind of stuff with a really, really detailed eye, I just let it go because I don't care because mm-hmm. it's awesome. Yeah. It's great. Would there have been a guy like Oddball? Maybe. Maybe not so hippy-dippy as he – yeah, Oddball. Well, I don't <laughs> he know. He probably didn't have a tank commander who survived for two months. You know? Probably. No, well, he didn't either. I've been collecting his whiskey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, if, if it's August – or September. Yeah, which you, th- you guess, you know, yeah. you assume, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was that wasn't a good duty. <laughs> or maybe maybe if there was a tank commander that had survived that long, maybe he really was like Godball. Yeah. A fatalist almost if he was, you know. So um final thoughts, Mike, can you sum this film up in a sentence or two? Fantastic. I I'm just one word. That's uh, the, like you you know when 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 I was asked to to appear on this this episode. I said, "Okay, well, I gotta let me check the, the the DVR. Let me let me look on cable, see if it's coming on." And it wasn't. So I bought a copy of it, and I was just thrilled to buy a copy of it because I didn't <laughs> own a copy of it. I bought it on Blu-ray, I'm, and I, and this will be one that I, I, I I'm, it, it's a part of my collection now, and I'm happy that it is. I don't know why it wasn't before. Yeah, Josh. Love it. You, I was gonna say fantastic. That was my evil plan. Love it. Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. You know. Bust out the thesaurus, find all the other ones for it. Just a great movie. Just solid, entertaining. When you look at it, holds up even better. When you look at it from a film standpoint, holds up even better. Just just love this movie. You know, normally I like to say, oh, well, I would suggest this movie for history people. And for not, I suggest this movie for anyone. Mm-hmm. Anyone across the board. It's entertaining, solid, and it's got some classic people in it doing some great stuff. A whole bunch of classic people. Yeah, yeah the cast is fantastic. And... Go ahead. Oh, I just I, it popped into my head because we were talking about it a second ago. Uh, I've talked to you know my father, uh, you know a couple other people's fathers who said that their fathers who were World War II veterans brought them to watch this movie in the theaters in '70 mm-hmm. and made a point to come and see this movie. And they said that their fathers loved it. You know that just popped into my head. I thought that was kind of interesting that. That even World War II vets back in the 70s are taking their kids to see this movie. So, you know, I, I kind of felt that that maybe said something about about how it came out in the end. Hmm. Larry? Yeah, I think it's one of the all-time greatest 
movies ever, you know. Uh, I think the only thing that's in the same league, league as this is probably The Dirty Dozen, you know. And that's another awesome movie. Much, an, much more awesome. grim. Uh, yeah, it's a little the, more, more grim, grim, but... Yeah. But it has but its, its comedy. It, it, it's, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, those two, I, I always kind of... Those two I see as sort of spiritual cousins, those two I, movies. Yeah, I agree. The group of guys going on a, a dangerous mission mm-hmm. together. But I, yeah. I, I, I like Kelly Her- Kelly's Heroes a little bit better, I think. I be- do, too. Because of the humor. Yeah. Pinkley's going to be a general. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Sutherland. Yeah. I yeah. think uh, Dirty Dozen is is more of like Misfits, you know, and, mm-hmm. and this and Kelly's Heroes, I think, is one of, you know, like kind of the Misfits cliche stuff. Kelly's Heroes, I think, is just... Just great because it's a little bit more focused on realism. It's regular dudes. Yeah, they're yeah. All, they're all regular. I mean, with the exception of Oddball, they're all mm-hmm. regular guys. You know, they're all regular GIs. I mean, you know, th- th- we've had the conversation in the past about, um, you know, in particular, there's one guy in particular in the film who who is very GI Pachuco. He he looks like yeah. a GI. You know, he's got the field face. He's got the beard. He's filthy looking. He's dirty. I had to go. I, we all got to go. But I mean, he looked. Like a GI, he he was very. G- Most of them were. I mean, yeah, they were old. Don Rickles was what? He had it was be. Navy, I think. He well, was, he was, but Navy. he was in what his forties, if that. I mean, he, he would have been as early. I mean, they were all older than they should have been, you know, yeah. in, in terms of uh, line infantry. But it, it doesn't matter. Again, you know, it doesn't matter. You look at Saving Private Ryan, and all those guys are too old to be mm. Rangers. In this movie, you don't care. They could be yeah. played by eighty-year-olds, which I guess they all are now, if they're still kicking. But let's let's do a Kelly's Heroes too with the same yeah. cast. I think most of them are dead. Unfortunately. Well, yeah, that's true. Telly Savalas is going. Big Joe's going. Yeah. I'd like wow. to see a sequel. Don Rickles. I'd like to be a, yeah. see a sequel just yeah. about Oddball's character. What happened to him? Afterwards, <laughs> where, where did he go when he rides off into the sunset in that tank? What happens next? Thinking a villa somewhere, <laughs> in Tuscany. I think, he, I think maybe. he goes to Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> you're probably right. And then to San Francisco after that. Yeah. Waits for the, the hippie yeah. generation to arrive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, fleeing to those neutral countries. I mean, you had how many air crews did it? Flew flew to Sweden. Sweden was the place to go. Switzerland was not the place to go. Right, they would right. intern you in Switzerland. Sweden, you kind of had the run of the show. You yeah. could do what you wanted to. It's like hundreds of Allied air crews faked battle damage to land in Sweden to get out of the, hmm. get out of the mess they were in. And I don't think they're going to let you drive across the border in a tiger, in a tiger with a couple tons yeah. of gold. They're going to have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, where the hell did he put all his gold in that tank? I don't know. It's the eternal question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, he's pretty creative. Moriarty yeah. is a mechanical genius. He is. <laughs> So anyway, I'll close this one like I do all of them, and I'll just say this, uh, I'll relay this quote from the movie, and I quote, You don't want in this thing, you don't get in this thing. I cut you out everything. I don't need you. 60 feet of bridge I could pick up almost anywhere. (laughs) Schmuck. (laughs) And with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. There will be no mini-episode next week, but we will return in two weeks when we discuss the 2014 movie Monuments Men. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Tessa Jager, and Music Shed Studios here in New Orleans. This has been a production of the National World War II Museum.